Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you, Eddie. My name's Stella, and I'm an alcoholic. I'll start by saying I'm very nervous, so um, if it shows, then I do apologize. It's my first time at this kind of uh, event up here, so I'll give it a go. Um, I had a call on the 2nd of May by John, um, who said, Are you, do you know if you're free on the 6th of September? I thought, blimey, he's living in the day, isn't he? You know? <laughs> And I said, I don't know, why? Oh, do you fancy sharing for me? And I just said, all right. Uh, and he said, it's at a mini convention, by the way. You're all right with that, aren't you? And I was like, Psh, what? He's having a laugh with me, you know. And I said, yeah, yeah, whatever, you know. Oh, uh, Clancy's going to be sharing there as well. That's okay, isn't it? And I was like, yeah. And I went to my sponsor. I said, oh, he's having a right laugh with me. And here I am. So... <laughs> Um, I'll start by saying um, 23rd of March 2008 um, was my first sober day, Um, so I'm coming up to a year and a half shortly. Um, I basically came in a very desperate, desperate girl. Um, Very luckily for me, um, I managed to keep my job by the skin of my teeth, you know, keep my job. Um, I had a little runaround car that I had, but... You know, I was pretty much two steps away from losing everything. Um, my health had really deteriorated. I was very jaundice, um, pretty much skin and bones. Um, my hair was like straw. I, oh, I was just absolutely awful. Um, I was a heavy smoker as well um, and chronic asthmatic. So, you know, asthma attacks pretty much every other night. And I thought that was the way to live, you know, absolutely awful. Um, But I didn't know what was wrong with me. I went to counsellors, I went to my doctor. I mean, he probably got bored of me the amount of times I went in and said, I don't know what's wrong with me, you know, I'm depressed, I'm this, I'm that, you know. I just couldn't put my finger on it. Um, And my mum finally said to me, do you think you might have an issue with drinking? I was like, no, you know, it's not not that, you know. well, the long and short of it is she she said to me, um, please, would you do me one favour and just call AA? I, yeah, all right, mum, yeah. Yeah, all right then. Um, I said, I'll do it tomorrow. And I was thinking, yeah, all right. Um, she phones me up in the morning, didn't even give me give me a chance to sort of wake up and said, I, I've phoned AA for you. Um, I've, I've got a mobile telephone number of a lady and I want you to phone her now. And I was like, right, okay, mum, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. thought I'll just give her some spiel about, you know, I spoke to someone. She said, uh, I want you to do it now and then ring me back and tell me what accent she has. I thought, ah, oh. <laughs> she gets me every time. So I phoned up this woman thinking, oh, you know, oh, I'll just speak to some tramp, as I had it in my mind, you know, I'll speak to this woman. And she said, oh, can I come round your flat? I thought, oh, my God, I've got some tramp coming round my flat now, you know. Never mind the fact that I was a tramp myself, but I had a roof over my head, so I wasn't really, you know, terrible. Um, so I phoned up my mum and I said, yes, she's Scottish, okay? She went, right, good. Is she coming around your flat? Yes, she is. Thanks for that, you know. So uh, I thought, I'm not going to tidy up because, you know, it's a tramp coming around my flat. <laughs> and this woman turns up in this bloody sports car, you know, like, oh, well, wow, it's a four by four. And she turns up in this suit and I'm thinking, oh, what? That's not AA. <laughs> she come in and, uh, you know, she sat down and I'm thinking, this is not right, you know, and this woman started talking to me about her own experiences and, you know, a lot of people that I've met in AA say that it didn't happen very quickly for them, you know, they say sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. I don't remember the specific thing that this lady said to me, but it was almost like a light bulb to me, it was like, wow, I think I know what my problem is, I think I'm an alcoholic. I didn't actually say that because it took me a while to actually get the pride together to say that. 
But she took me to a meeting that night and I remember I had my head down. I wouldn't look at anybody. I don't remember who was sharing. I don't... I think I remember about two people in that meeting that I know now um, who came up. And I thought, oh, God, you know, I don't have to socialise with these people, do I? You know, I looked absolutely awful, but, you know, in my head I didn't. I looked great, you know. (laughs) Oh, God. Um, So I went to that meeting and... Like I say, I don't really remember what was said or anything like that, but something must have happened because I went back to a meeting the next night, and I believe I went the night after that as well. Um, you know, and that and that was the first day of my sobriety. So you know, I kind of owe my life to my mum for a start for doing it for me because I'm not sure if I would have done it myself, to, if I'm quite honest. And then this lady that took the time to come round my house and she had no idea who I was, so, you know, she took a risk there, really. So I was in in and around AA for about a month or so and they were talking about sponsorship and I I was thinking, oh, God, you know, don't really want to do this malarkey. What's that God thing about, you know, sort of... Not really, still not really talking to many people, got my head down, not a lot of confidence and... uh, I saw this lady, I went to this one meeting on a Monday night and and it had only just begun this meeting so there was only a fair few people in there and I walked in and I heard this laughter in the kitchen and I thought, who's that, you know, laughing at an AA meeting (laughs) and I went in and she was um, making this big joke and I just thought, blimey, that lady's very happy she's a very happy lady and I watched her for a while and I thought, I want her to be my sponsor but then obviously the uh, the fear kicked in. It's like, what if she says no? You know? <laughs> really, what what is the worst that can happen? But, you know, I never thought about that. It was like, oh, I can't bear her saying no. So uh, I waited till I think it was the Thursday night and I was trying to approach her and trying to approach her and there was all these bloody people around her. And I was thinking, oh, can't you just leave her alone? I want to go and speak to her, you know, all that pathetic, I'm important stuff, you know. And... Uh, I I didn't manage to do it. I completely bottled it, and I went home. I was beating myself up for a bit, thinking, oh, you know, just bloody do it. Just ask her. It's not that hard, surely. So I phoned her up, and uh, luckily for me, she said it would be an honour. So, um, you know, that lady is still my sponsor, and uh, she's got me through a hell of a lot. She's taken me through the steps thoroughly, um, you know, and it's been not only that, There's she's loved me, she's fed me chocolate (laughs) we've been out shopping together and we have a laugh and we still do so you know that's absolutely fantastic um but like i say my my health was really bad at the beginning um it was i came in in the march in may i decided my, my granddad passed away and i decided that i would do the race for life for him um but I actually kind of walked it with my mum and my cousin and I struggled with that. I struggled walking. It was only 5k, so it's just over three miles. And I walked and I got all the way around and I was really proud of myself. Well, this year in May, I ran it. And that to me is just, that's how far I've come physically. That is just a miracle. I managed to quit smoking in January this year. So I was very, very pleased with myself. You know, my health is improving. Um, My family relationships, that had just gone right down the pan, really. My brother disowned me, pretty much, and said, if you don't sort yourself out, you're not welcome in my life. Um, He'd just had a new baby boy, his first child. Uh, You're not welcome in his life either, unless you get yourself sorted. I'm now part of my nephew's life, and oh, he's just absolutely adorable. Um... He actually, you know, he wants to see me. He comes up and running up to me and hugs me. And it's absolutely, it's just a miracle to me, really. Um, I, like I say, I managed to keep my job by the skin of my teeth. Um, And I'm still with the same company. They made me redundant on the team that I was on, which is kind of a good thing because I wasn't enjoying it very much. And I think they were getting a bit suspicious. So uh, thank you, God. Uh, and I managed to get, I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll aim for HR because they won't make me redundant up there. 
not that I really want the job, but, you know, are going to go work for HR. That was the initial thought. And then the more I thought about it, the more I thought, oh, I really want this job. And I, you know, prayed to God and I spoke to my sponsor about it and I went for it and I got it. And I was really, really pleased with myself. I was just on top of the world, you know. Give it about three months, I was bored. Didn't enjoy it anymore. Wanted to get out. And I was thinking, what am I going to do with myself? Because, you know, I'm I'm a little bit bored with office work because that's all I've ever really done other than McDonald's. We were talking about that this morning when I was 16. Yeah. Terrible. Um, you know, so I thought I need to do something better with my life. Now, a couple of years ago when I was still actively drinking, I remember thinking to myself, I'd really like to be in the police force. And obviously... I wouldn't have had a chance in hell if I'd have applied at that point. Um, you know, they, they would have probably just taken one look at me and just, pff, no chance. So, um, you know, I t- managed, luckily, to talk myself out of it and say, no, you can't do that. So that kind of went out of my head. And then recently I've been thinking, they're, they're making me redundant again in HR. Yes, that's right. You know, the place where I thought I'd be safe. Obviously not. Um, and that's going to happen at around June, July time this, uh, next year. So um, we'll just see what happens there. But this is the difference with me. When I was made redundant from my last team, panic set in. And all I could think was, what am I going to do? I'm going to be homeless. I'm going to starve to death. You know, <laughs> all this, oh, poor me, you know, oh, what am I going to do? Never mind the fact that, you know, my mum is only really around the corner and she will help me out if I get stuck. You know, that doesn't even come into it. Um, so panic, panic. This time, it's almost like, well, you know, I'm a bit bored of the job anyway. And, and so what if I have to take on a job that's less pay or or something like that while I look for something else? You know, I'm not, I'm not going to starve to death and I've got a roof over my head. Incidentally, the roof over my head, um, when I came into AA, I was living with an, an, I believe, an active alcoholic, although it's not really my place to say, but, you know, I kind of moved in with her because her mum owned a pub. So, um, you know, it was kind of like, oh, yeah, I'll move in with you. That'd be great. <laughs> then I stopped drinking and started going to AA, and uh, we, we started falling apart really both of us it was an old friend from school and me and I got on really well and by the end of it you know oh, we were like enemies it was terrible um, and I and I still even when I was in AA not drinking suffering quite a lot while she was still drinking in the, in the flat and leaving beer cans everywhere and all that and coming home drunk at night you know I thought I could handle that I thought I'm all right you know but obviously I couldn't handle that, and it was getting oh, it's getting awful. But I was so full of fear that I wasn't ready to live on my own. I've never lived on my own. I've always lived with friends. You know, I can't do it on my own. I'm not. I'm not um, adult enough. I'm not strong enough. And and what if I get frightened? You know, and, oh, all these stupid little thoughts. Um, in recovery, I moved out of that place and I now live on my own in a flat and I'm supporting myself. And that, to me, is another miracle of coming into recovery. You know, my whole life is just absolutely fantastic. It is changing by the day. Um, I also got a nice new car. It's not new, but it, I had a really clapped out piece of junk, really, for five years. Um, and now I've got a decent car. Um, so I got that when I came into recovery as well. So, I mean, everything in my life has just improved, improved, improved. Um, I got into service quite early on, um, started doing literature in the meeting. And then because I, you know, I'm all or nothing, I got literature in another meeting as well. So I was doing two lots, um, <laughs> which in, in the end I was told I was a bit greedy because I was kind of taking it off other people. So I, I gave one of them up carried on the other one and now I'm a speaker secretary at the Ringwood meeting on a Wednesday night um, that's all new to me as well um, I say my prayers in the morning I phone my sponsor on a daily basis um, mainly to moan because that's what I like doing you know I phoned her up uh, recently and I said oh I've had enough of this job they're all you know they're treating me really badly and all this and she's 
all right, all right, you know, and I went on for quite a while. And she said, um, well, if I'm honest with you, if you were um, the boss and you employed somebody and, uh, you know, they started sort of, they came in and one minute they're in a mood, the next minute they're all happy and they're approachable, the next minute they're grouch, growling everybody and, you know, oh God, don't go near her today and all that. And then she's off for long periods of absence and then when she comes back all she does is whinge about this, that and the other. Would you employ you? <laughs> <laughs> well, my logic didn't set in straight away and agree with her, but, you know, in my head. But after a while, I thought, you know, she's got a point there. So, uh, thank God for my sponsor, because uh, I would have gone right off on one in my own head there and made it all up. They're all out to get me. Um, <laughs> but anyway, going back to, yeah, the job thing, I'm, I'm just so excited about it right now. And, you know, I... I in a way, some people would say it's not really anything to do with um, being an alcoholic, but to me it is because I've never had a goal in life. Um, I remember leaving school and everybody knew what they wanted to do, and I didn't. And I was actually quite fearful about that. Um, you know, everyone's going, oh, I'm going to be a vet, and I'm going to be this. And I'm thinking, I don't know what I want to do. I really don't. And, uh, you know, it's been like that most of my life. And then I, I left school, then I went on, went on to college, um, drunk my first year away. Second year, my tutor was waiting at the college and she, he phoned my mum and said, she's got about an hour to get her coursework in, otherwise she fails the whole lot. So my mum drove me up there and I gave it in and because of him, I managed to get my A-levels because I, I had no intention of going up there and giving it to him because it was interfering with my time, you know, <laughs> my valuable time. Um, so yeah, I got my A levels, but then I still didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't want to stay in what I studied. There's the logic, you know. Um, so I just took on an office job and then another office job and just carried on. And I almost feel like I've been carried through all of it. Like I haven't really tried. I haven't, not really bothered one way or the other whether I get a job or not. You know, it's been like that most of my life. And, uh, I suppose in a way I'm very lucky to have what I've got without really trying. Um, but this time, you know, I I am determined that this is what I want to do. I want to go into the police and that's what I want to do. Um, so, you know, I was praying to God and I was speaking to my sponsor. I was like, please, you know, help me do this. And uh, I looked on the website. They're not recruiting. I was like, oh, when am I going to be able to do this, you know, what if I get made redundant and all the fear kicks in, you know, and then it's the, yeah, well, you can't do it anyway, you know, because you're not good enough, and it's all that going on in your head, and then I thought, no, what's stopping me, honestly, there's nothing stopping me, you know, if I really want this, I can really try, that's the best I can do, is try, so um, I kept looking at the website, kept looking at the website, and eventually it said, we are recruiting, we are opening up a recruitment campaign. I, I nearly fell off my chair. I was at work, just supposed to be working. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, and I thought, there's my chance, you know. And it said, right, you've got to phone this number on the 2nd of September. No, 1st of September. And it's first come, first serve basis for 500 application forms. Once they've been given out, that's it. You know, and they don't know when they're doing it again. So it could be six months, could be another year, you know. And I thought, I've got to get one of them forms. So uh, I got a family member to help as well. Um, and he was phoning for me as well. I couldn't get through. And I was on my way to work. The phone line opened at 20 to 9 and I started work at 9. So I was frantically phoning, hanging up, phoning, hanging up because it was engaged. And uh, I was just you know, getting to that point where I was despairing, thinking, I've got to go into the office in a minute and I'm not going to be able to sit there on the phone. So what am I going to do, you know? And I just looked up at the sky and I said, please, God, please help me. And I had a phone call and it was my family member and he said, I've got you one. And that to me, again, is like another little God job. It's like, thank you, you know. And then the next stage is a um, recruitment workshop uh, tomorrow evening. Again, first come, first serve basis. 
and I got that as well. So I'm going off to that tomorrow night. And to me, every step of this process, I've asked, I've begged, I've prayed, I've talked to my sponsor, I've been open and honest with people around me. And it seems to be happening, you know. It's it's just a miracle, absolute miracle. Um, and, you know, fingers crossed, I'll be able to do it. But if I don't, I don't. And I will try again because there's nothing I can't do other than pick up a drink. And that's that's the way I've got to look at my life. I've done a step four. My sponsor tells me, once you've done one of them, you can do anything. And I, I believe that because it's happening. You know, I might be in a bit of doubt at first, but things are happening for me. And, you know, the more I analyse it, the more I think, oh, no, what if, what if, what if, the more it doesn't happen. So if I just let it go and just go, okay, if this doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. If, you know, it's just the way, it's such a brilliant way to live for me. And it's taken me quite a while to get this when people have said, let go, let God. I've gone, oh, it's easy for you to say, how do you do it, you know? Um, but at a day at a time, it is happening for me. Um, I went to the Guildford thing, uh, New Year's Eve, and uh, that was fantastic as well. So I'm hopefully going again this year. Um, what else can I... Uh, uh, I'm, I'm just really, really, really grateful to be in this fellowship. There are absolutely thousands of things that I've probably forgotten to say, and when these guys share next, I'll be thinking, oh, I should have said that. But, um, you know, what will be will be. I handed it over today, and I thought, well, whatever comes out, comes out. So uh, I hope it's been okay, and uh, thank you for inviting me, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much, Stella. Um, and it now gives me great pleasure to pass over to Cathy, who's going to share for us. Thank you, Cathy. Thanks, Eddie. Is this working? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you, Eddie, and, and thank you, Stella. My name's Cathy, and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> and um, John phoned me up about 10 days ago, I think it was, and, well, he didn't actually text and said, um, are you going to the Colbury Convention? And I text back and I said, yes, do you need any help? Thinking, chairs putting out, making the tea, something like that. And he texts back and asked me if I would share, and um, I rang, I rang, <laughs> you know, oh, crikey. And if I could have done that share, um, that I did that night in bed when I'd agreed to it, you would have been bored to tears and it would have sounded like a lecture, you know. Um, and I put some notes down here. In the in the unlikely events, I have to say that I dry up, but it's always been a fear of mine that I'll dry up, and it's never happened. Anyway, <clears throat> the theme of this convention, um, excuse me, I've got a bit of a cold. The theme of this convention is a new beginning. And um, I was thinking about, you know, my recovery. Nine years ago today, and almost to the hour, on the bank holiday Sunday a week ago, I stood outside the Bridewell in Southampton, having spent a night in, um, in their accommodation, um, having, having smacked my car completely drunk into the neighbour's wall. I had no, I have no recollection of deciding to take the car out drunk, um, and you know, no like intent of, of realising I was drunk. Active blackouts were just starting for me, and and I'm aware as well because at, at that time I lived on a busy road uh, that if anybody, and it was the main um, pathway to the hospital, if any had been walking down and got between the back of my car and the neighbour's wall, um, I would have killed them. Anyway. Um, so I sat there. I remember sitting there in the car because the impact must have um, um, brought me round, and and I'd flattened, I'd flattened this great big pillar. So I was going at some rate, and I sat there, and with my head in my hands, thinking maybe somebody will help me, maybe they will see how ill I am, um, because I knew I was ill, but I didn't realise it had anything to do with alcohol, the alcohol that I was drinking. Anyway, so there we go. <coughs> um, did. <laughs> Actually, with the benefit of hindsight, I look back and they were they were just so kind when they need not have been because I was I was just as drunk as a mop, you know. So off I went and sobered up overnight and got turfed out into the bright August sunshine because it was just at the end of August.
honest. And I was driving here today and I thought, how many times at my lowest points with this disease and in my drinking, was it bright sunshine when I had a wake up call? You know, you kind of squint through it, don't you? And, and the world looks like a happy place and the sun's shining and people are walking around. And there I was stood there not, not knowing what to do with myself. But I had in my hand a little yellow pamphlet because even in the cells I was trying to be a good girl and, um, and I realised that my cover had been blown um, and that my carefully constructed regular life, um, my fiercely defended regular life, this concrete life I built up around myself with all my social badges of job and children and house, the marriage had gone at this point, um, um, where I'd been rumbled. Somehow I knew deep down inside I'd been rumbled and I wasn't going to be able to convince anybody that I was all right anymore. And I think I'd known for a length of time I wasn't all right at all. So there we go. So I have my little yellow um, pamphlet with all the names and addresses of people that you can phone for drugs and drink and it. And on the back was Alcoholics Anonymous and something stuck with that number. So I went home, um, let myself in. Um, my children at the time were what were they, 9 and 10? Yeah, 9 and 10, or 9 and 11, something like that. Um, I went home and dialed the AA number and spoke, I can't remember who I spoke to, I can't remember very much about the conversation, other than I agreed to go to a meeting that night. Um, and I got there 48 hours later because I got drunk that afternoon and the following day. Um, but on Tuesday, I stayed sober long enough to be picked up and, and was taken to my first meeting. And I look back now and I think, I, you know, I, I wasn't possibly one of AA's brightest hopes at that point. I didn't know anything about alcoholism. I didn't think I had a drink problem. I knew I was going to court. I knew I had to have a goodie bag. I knew I had to be a good girl and prove I was taking it seriously. And that's why I went to my first AA meeting. Um, the lady who picked me up, bless her, um, she was beautifully made up. She did drive an old banger, um, you know, and she had rings all over her fingers and lipstick on. And um, and she nattered all the way down to this meeting. Da -da 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 -da. I think you're, you must feel your life is over and I, you know, and I've been in here and that you're never going to have a life again. I'm sitting there. I didn't get my eyes above this level. And I was sitting there and thinking, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's over. I just felt it was over. Anyway, we pulled up at, um, outside the meeting in Southampton um, and there were lots of people standing outside and they were talking and they were laughing and they were greeting each other and they were shaking hands and hugging and I was horrified, absolutely horrified. Oh, don't touch me, don't touch me, you know, don't come anywhere near me. And they didn't, funnily enough, nobody did. <laughs> <laughs> I was no pretty sight, but I have managed to have a wash and I must have dried, I don't, can't remember if my clothes are clean or not, but I know I had, I'd had a wash that day and I wasn't, oh, I hadn't actually drunk any alcohol. Um, and I knew I wanted what I saw people had. And if I had to say I was an alcoholic, I would have said I was an alcoholic. If I'd have had to say I was a druid and take my clothes off and dance around a cauldron, I would have done that too. Because I wanted to join your club and I didn't know how. And so that was my new beginning. That weekend was my new beginning. Um, I didn't go skipping down the road to happy sobriety, um, you know. I kicked and screamed and struggled and fought, really, with myself and with this disease for the next two and a half years. Um, and, and it took two and a half years for me to become teachable. But I remember, again, um, that weekend, and my companions at that weekend were terror, bewilderment, frustration, and despair. My life was going to rat shit, and I'd no, excuse my language, <laughs> my life was falling apart around my ears, and I had no idea why. And um, when I heard that bit in the big book about the four horsemen, you know, they were my companions and they'd been galloping. I, I, you know, I liken it in my mind to, to this disease where the dust cloud, there's a bit of a rumble on the horizon and the cloud gets a bit of dust on the horizon. It gets a bit bigger and it gets a bit bigger and all of a sudden it's coming and it's coming and this sense of impending doom that I'd had throughout the whole of that year, of the year 2000, something changed in my drinking um, at the millennium the Millennium Celebrations, and I kind of took the brakes off it. So, well, how did I get here? Um, drink didn't pay any significant part in my life, alcohol itself, for the first 34 years of it. But the isms, alcoholism, I believe today that I was born with it. Um, I was born in the northwest of England in the 1950s in a coal mining cotton mill town. Um, we were poor, but we weren't dirt poor. Um, 
and my father, bless him, died of this disease, died about 17 years ago. But heavy drinking was the culture. Um, I was of an Irish Catholic background, first generation into the UK, but all the family had come with my mum and with my dad's grandmother, you know, they'd all come over. So not a lot of family were left in Ireland. And anyway, I was born in England. <coughs> um, but that was the culture I was born into. And so heavy drinking was, was kind of normal. And so I didn't really think anything about it. I didn't like drinking and and I remember being offered my first taste of alcohol when I was about 12 on a Sunday evening and we had these weak bitter shandies and I thought it was disgusting I really didn't want to know and and so but the isms were there um you know I was a runner I was always leaving home I left home as early as as a, a small child with a three week three wheel trike and I would pack my teddies into it and I'd trundle off down to the bottom of the street and I get frightened and I trundle back again and unpack everything and and you know I was I was just a very restless discontented person even as a small child and I was a very frightened child as well when I look back now but I didn't realize I was frightened and I became a very angry child and I became a self-harming child and I became a, a child that could not do life and I couldn't do life in my teenage years um, you know briefly touch on it I developed an eating disorder etc 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 um, I was quite bright and I passed a scholarship to go to a private school and I was bitterly resentful because uh, none of my <laughs> none of my friends went there um, because nothing ever suited me you know my parents were so proud of this I didn't even know I'd been entered for it but they were so proud of it and um, but I hated it um, did I really enjoy anything I couldn't tell you I don't think so can I remember? And I, and I tried, you know, in recovery, I've looked back and I think, do I ever any happy memories of my childhood? And it wasn't my childhood, it was me. But I didn't see that at the time. Anyway, so there we go. So I was 17 years old, I had a shed load of qualifications. I had an attitude that would kill. Um, I knew by then I was beginning to get some inkling that I wasn't a well settled person. And all I wanted to do was travel. So in those days, this would be the 1970s um, by then, I bought a motorbike in the days when you could go in with your money and buy a motorbike and a crash helmet and some L plates, and present your um, provisional license and ride it out of the shop. And that's exactly what I did. And I must have crashed it half a dozen times driving it home because I didn't know anything about gears. And I went down instead of up, you know, and fell off it and all of this. Anyway, I packed it on a train and left home a couple of months later and <laughs> I, went, I went off to work in Yorkshire um, by the sea oh, and it was freezing and and that was you know I mean no thoughts whatsoever I was supposed to go in with a friend and she'd met somebody she wouldn't come with me so I went on my own anyway and you know so I arrived at, at this guest house and it was a Christian guest house which my mother approved of because she wouldn't have let me leave home I don't think at 17 and I wasn't really defiant as a child you know inwardly I boil um, but I wasn't I wasn't wasn't defiant I was quite a compliant studious apparently so child um, and teenager and so I left home and you know there we go I left home and I never cared I never went back really um, I was catapulted I fell in love um, hook line and sinker with the kitchen porter I was a chambermaid and and there we he could ride my motorbike so we were set really bought another crash um, and off we went and um, you know, and I was set, this was it, my knight in shining armour, life, this is how life was going to be. And then, yeah, his parents came to, to see who this person was, me, um, and they pulled up in a Rolls Royce and I was catapulted into this lifestyle in, in, was it North Manchester, South Manchester we lived, bordering on Cheshire, you know, where the lounge was big enough that if one person sat over there, one person sat over here, you, you couldn't hear each other speak. You had to walk across it and uh, there was more than one bathroom and they were both indoors and that kind of thing. Um, and I had Jesus sandals, cheesecloth and a head full of plaits and, um, and no money whatsoever. And it kind of all went over my head but I wasn't drinking. And so, you know, there we go. I, I lived that lifestyle for three years in between, you know, Saint Tropez, we went down, we went all over Europe, we, we just did the biz and nobody took anything seriously there because there was an awful lot of money. But they were nice people um, and they welcomed me into their home and I couldn't settle, I couldn't settle. 
and and in the end you know and I looked for logical reasons for this to try and explain to myself why I was like I was and I had no idea and so you know that that ended when I was 20 years old and Stella funny you should mention that you know I did a few more geographicals and I joined the police force <laughs> in Lancashire Constabulary you didn't have to struggle so hard in the 70s to join the police force you know um, I was half a centimetre under the right height I could talk a good talk and and they let me in and I spent two years in the Pennines freezing my ass off amongst the hills walking the beat you know uh, and anyway so there we go wrong career choice I left and did some more geographicals but throughout all of this even in that heavy drinking culture I I never sought alcohol I drank it um, I, I didn't become obsessed with it I didn't crave it I drank it because there's an awful lot of it about but I was lonely frightened isolated and I ended up having a nervous breakdown and off I cleared off in, uh, off into Europe then I thought oh there's something very wrong with me um, and I don't know what it is um, so I'm just going to pack up and go to Europe and if I die and don't come back so be it you know I can't carry on living like this that was my logic so off I went Higher power, higher power, higher power. How I was looked after. I hitchhiked on my own. There was nothing I was frightened of because I had no normal emotions at that point, none. So people would say, you're really brave doing this. You're really brave. And I thought, it didn't cost me anything. There was no sense of fear. Anyway, I pitched up working for the American Army in Germany in 1979. And... Um, there was a huge American presence in Germany and I got quite a good job and there are a lot of ex-Vietnam ex vets there so I was kind of a nutter amongst nutters if you like I didn't really stand out there's an awful lot of drugs an awful lot of alcohol and I, I didn't play I was just not drinking or drugging um, at that time in my life but I started to get better and I started to talk a bit about how I felt and I got some help and I needed this 12-step program then um, but I, I in my own mind wouldn't have drunk enough to qualify so there you go anyway Anyway, more geographicals and, you know, fast forward through the 1980s, came back to the UK, got um, started to do some training. Um, again, geographical, higher power stuff. I ended up in Southampton, got off the bus to go to the interview, took one look down the high street, thought, crikey, what a dump, not staying here. I'll get back into the interview process and, and go up north. And I <laughs> got the place, got the job, um, and then became ill and missed all my northern interviews. Big recession on. I'd have to wait years to get to do what I wanted to do up north. So I stayed in Southampton. Fast forward on, you know, um, Kathy did whatever Kathy wanted to do, and I followed every dream I had, thinking it would make me make me feel better. Stop smoking, didn't drink, um, had friends all over the place, climbed mountains, learned to sail, blah de blah de blah. Got super keep fit, none of which made me happy. You know, as soon as I could swim a mile, I had to swim a mile every time I swam. When I could cycle 70 miles, I had to cycle 70 miles every time I cycled, otherwise I'd failed. I demanded so much of myself with this disease trundling along with no solution to it um, that that I could never meet my own expectations other people never expected from me what I expected from myself um, I had to you know anyway so there we go so we'll trundle through the 80s to the mid to the mid 80s when I I met my first husband and funnily enough I was drunk because the cracks were showing in this life um, and and I had a, had the boyfriend at the time had a 1200cc motorbike we'd just gone racing around the northwest of England you know and we'd come down I'm throwing a party in the house I was I was living in um, I got wasted on something um, which was rare it was very rare people had never really seen me drink I got wasted passed out woke up and carried on drinking uh, I was unaware of it and my future husband was at that party Anyway, so there we go. A couple of years later, we got married, we bought a house. And Kathy, at that point in her life, I had resigned myself to making the best of trying to deal with what I knew was a madness um, and, and not being rumbled until I could die. That was my best option at the age of 24, 25, 26, 27, in my 20s. That was my best hope for my life. And so there we go. Anyway, one marriage, one house. Margaret Thatcher's 80s, get a bigger house, got a bigger house. I didn't really give a toss where I lived, to be honest, but I went along with it because, I was, you know, my husband wanted to do it, and quite right so. Some people do have ambitions. I didn't have any. He had ambitions. And off we went. And two children later brought me to the early 1990s. Um, and in the early 1990s, this disease was rumbling on the horizon again. I knew it was after me. I didn't know what it was. Um, I tried everything I could to fix it. I'd got all these social accomplishments that didn't work. And I knew it was after me, but I didn't know what it was. And I found drink. 
I found alcohol and alcohol became my solution and that ended a couple of years later. I knew I was in serious trouble with alcohol um, but I wasn't and I phoned up a helpline and I phoned up a helpline in London because I thought if I phone up in Southampton such as my paranoia the lottery fingers would come over the house and it would be me and they'd follow me down the street. So I phoned up an anonymous helpline in London and I, and I went to an alcohol counselling service and, um, and she asked me, she said, my dear, when I told her how much I drank, she said, is that a day? And I nearly fell off my chair because that was my weekly consumption at that time. So I had, um, you know, tea and sympathy and a divorce, a divorce. I put all my problems on the marriage boat and the husband boat. I pushed it out into the lake and it was going to get better. And of course it didn't. So, and that brought me um, to the year 2000 and, and the incident, the drink driving incident, um, and really, when I look back now, what I put those children through, I made these alcoholic decisions, um, you know, I, and I took them with me. Um, it wasn't a right marriage, but that's no excuse for my behaviour. And so, anyway, so there we go to the year 2000. Anyway, um, so, so there I was at my first AA meeting. And for the next two and a half years, Kathy tried Kathy's way to stop drinking. I was a boat drinker. I didn't drink every day and I didn't drink in the day. And so I thought I could stop it. Gave me this illusion of control over alcohol. I didn't feel powerless over alcohol. I had one episode of what I call my big drink where at 11 o'clock on a Monday morning, it occurred to me a drink might be good. And I, I came round two and a half weeks later in hospital and I've got no recollection really of that. But that was the only time that happened and I needed that. I needed that to get identification because when I first came to AA although I wanted to join the club I had no identification with the drinking at all and I was looking for the differences not the similarities I was looking for an English person as it happened <laughs> in that meeting and um, you know my attitude was just mm, I might as well have had F off written across my forehead um, I, I didn't really associate with people I was special and different and if only you would listen to me people would say okay, you know listen just listen oh, you are listening to me you don't understand my problems are so different it's not the drink there's something more to it and I, and I couldn't listen enough until I'd taken that last drink and I took my last drink on June the 1st 2003 and on June the 2nd 2003 I woke up barking mad absolutely barking mad and I phoned for help and I was 12th step by somebody who's in this meeting and um, today and that lady um, had been in only been in the fellowship herself about 18 months she was about to lose her home through no fault of her own and she got off her hands and knees from cleaning um, the rented house that she had to leave and came to 12th step me and she took me for a meet to a meeting every day that week and that's how this fellowship works it's incredible how it works and and then I went and I learned to listen and suddenly I could hear everything through a different set of ears, you know. I started to be quiet, I started to listen, I could get identification. I was broken, I was broken mentally, even though physically I was quite well, I was broken mentally and I knew I couldn't do it on my own and I knew I was an alcoholic, I completely accepted it. I'd never stayed away from meetings in that two and a half years because I also knew me on my own, out there without this fellowship, no chance, no chance. And, and I felt that if I kept coming back, um, somehow, somewhere along the line, I might get it. And there was hope in these rooms. There was always hope in these rooms. Nobody ever criticized me or, or laughed at me. They just said, keep coming back. And so much kindness in that time was shown to me. People went out of their way to take me to meetings. You know, it amazes me how this fellowship works. Um, because they wanted to see me get well, not for any other reason. So... And then we read chapter 5 at the beginning of this, and, and that's it. Rarely have we seen a, a person fail who's thoroughly followed our path. And I'd never even given the program of recovery half a chance. You know, I'd taken one look at it. I'd seen the word God. I'd remembered the convent, and I wasn't having anything to do with that, thank you. And, <laughs> yeah, um, and the other steps I couldn't really see a problem with. You know, if you could get God out of it, um, there wasn't really a problem because I, you know, I had a problem with alcohol, and I drank too much of it every now and again, and the consequences were beginning to show, but that was it really what did the program have to do with me um, and yet somehow I knew that was the gateway between where I was and where all of you were but I couldn't get it like the child outside the playground for so much of my life holding on to the railings watching you all play and not being able to join in something something stopped me from being, really oh, crikey I better get on with this anyway so um so that 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 was my new beginning and that's the theme of this convention 
So after I'd taken my last drink, I threw myself into this program like I throw myself into everything else, you know. Um, I started to do the steps. I got a sponsor. Um, I was honest as I could be at the time with the sponsor, and I went through those steps with that last drink. And the waking up the following morning, I got steps one, two, and three as a gift. They were a gift. I'd been given the gift of de desperation, and I was given the gift of the first three steps. Step four I wrote that week. And, and because I believe, for me, I was just so angry that it was like a volcano. And until at least I'd made some attempt at step four and released some of this stuff, there was no room for any more recovery. So I did steps four and step, steps five very quickly afterwards, followed by step six and step seven, because I'd learned enough to know that my character defects would kill me. If I nursed my character defects and fed the bad stuff and not the good stuff of these monkeys on my shoulder, um, I drink again. And so, and I could, with all humility, ask for these character defects to be removed, or at least, you know, I can't, can't, can't rightly recall the set, but please remove from me these character defects. And that's part of my daily prayer because they'll still kill me, you know, <laughs> it didn't turn me into a perfect person. And then there was a long pause, but the greatest relief for me. Um, came when I became willing to make amends to those I'd harmed because I never thought I would. I just never thought I'd get over the resentments I've managed to accumulate and nurse for all of those years in my life. And we, when I became willing to make amends to those I'd harmed, it gave me the greatest freedom I've ever known. And fortunately for me, or higher power stuff, it was just before Christmas, so that gave me an ideal opportunity to contact people by way of Christmas cards and sorry to have been out of touch and whatever, you know. Um, by the way, I'm really sorry for my behaviour. I did a lot of it that way. And, and then the maintenance steps of 11, 10, 11, and 12 um, that I do, you know, not perfectly. And, and so there you go. This program, this program is about progress, not perfection. And I'll just really finish on um, what my life is like today. Today, as I sit here, you know, I know I'm really, I'm really quite tired because I moved house and blah, 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 blah. It doesn't always make my life manageable, um, but it keeps me away from a drink one day at a time. My life is beyond my wildest dreams. As they say, catapulted into the fourth dimension. I haven't got a clue what people were talking about because that would have been my idea of having another boyfriend with a big motorbike <laughs> and roaring across the United States or climbing Count, uh, Mount Kilimanjaro and looking at whatever Mount water falls go down it you know that was my idea of um the fourth dimension not having a responsible job taking responsibility for my two at the time frightened disturbed children and nurturing them through teenagehood and certainly not taking on a german shepherd you know <laughs> puppy because my children wanted it you know like i needed more responsibility like another hole in the head there are skid marks down the road to my recovery, and I've trudged it on many occasions, um, inwardly rebelling, but outwardly doing it. You know, the bottom line was I knew I had to do it in order to survive until, until it got good enough for me to start to enjoy my life. I couldn't begin to describe my life. It's absolutely... Um, Again, beyond my wildest dreams, I am beginning to dry, to dry up. But for me to say um, I'm an alcoholic, I'm Kathy, and I'm an alcoholic, there's absolutely no shame um, attached to that at all. I never knew what I was, and I never knew what was the matter with me. And by the grace of God, alcohol became my outward problem, and I got this 12-step program of recovery. Because, um, you know, no more than the, the yets that people talk about, I wouldn't have the agains. I would not have that 34 years of life and the state that I used to be in trying to do life with no program, no solution, no way of living um, compared to how I do life today with it. And I'll, I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cathy. Um, and the, it, it leads me to hand over to Ronnie now, who's going to share for us. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. My name's Ron. I'm an alcoholic. Um, I, I believe we're being taped on this. And um, what I think about it, you sit and think about the ideas about carrying this message, that somewhere along the line, this meeting's going to be heard. Someone's going to be sitting in their front room listening to this tape. And for the sake of them, my name's Ron. I'm an alcoholic. Welcome to the World Convention here at Wembley Stadium. <laughs> Just think of it, they'd be saying, I'm sure it said Southampton on the label. I, I, I like having a, a little bit of a joke and a giggle to start with, and I'll tell you why, because when I sit here, I'm nervous, I'm scared. 
and we had that minute silence and every time I'm sitting here um, I'm a selfish alcoholic and in that minute silence it's, it's, it's a, we, we, wait, we say a prayer for the suffering alcoholic and whilst I sit up here I'm suffering um, I hate it the first share I ever did was at the Bournemouth Convention I've got to you, I've got a sponsor who's the son of the devil he, he really is he's, 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 he may even be the devil incarnate I don't know but he's not a nice man and he doesn't know nothing about sponsorship you'll hear more about that later on um, he's just a nasty piece of work never give me a cuddle or a bit of chocolate I've got to tell you <laughs> and um, anyway the first share he ever got me to do was at the Bournemouth Convention and I was sitting and I was frightened like I am now fear and a fella leant over to me and said that's ok Ronnie it gets better and that was the first lie I was ever told in AA and I've been told many more since and what another fella said to me he said Ronnie he said, do you know what the fear is he said, it's your ego. That's all it is, it's just your ego. He said, and if you're ever sitting there and you ain't got the fear, do you know what that is? I said, no, what? He said, that's your ego. So, um, I'm just an egotistic, selfish alcoholic, I suppose. I'm going to just part with it. Um, but what he said to me was something really beautiful. He, he, he said, Ronnie, he said, if you turn your will in your life over to the care of God, he said, why do you want to take it back when you want to do a share? He said, just turn it over to God. And a little while after that, I heard a prayer on the tapes. The share tapes really got me through a lot of stuff in the early days, you know. And I heard a guy saying a prayer, and I liked the prayer. And in that moment of silence, when I'm sitting up here or in a meeting doing a share, I remember that prayer and I say it, and I, and I turn the share over to the, over to the God of my understanding. So whatever really comes out, comes out. And, and, um, and I'll just waffle on until it does, really. And... Um, I, I, I love listening to these two shares up here and what I love listening about this type of thing is, is it just shows how many different roads there are to these rooms you know and yet there's identification for me in everything I've heard up here today total identification with it and yet total different lives you know but it all gets us here and, and it got me here my, my story is um, it's just my story I, I, I'm going to try and tell you the truth because the, the honest truth is I don't know the truth. I can't remember much of it, and I had such an imagination in my drinking that I don't know if what I'm going to tell you is the truth or a lie. But I, 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 I'll, I'll, be my, and I'll give you an example. So you, you guys be the judge whether I'm lying or not. I've got shattered kneecaps, all right? And I shattered my kneecaps, and there's two stories there I shattered my kneecaps. The first story was, it happened 16 years ago, a low-level parachute jump over Baghdad. <laughs> That's one version. The other version was I was pissed as a farm fell off a roof. So you, you, you kind of work out when you think one is waffling and, 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 and telling a bit of a porky somewhere along the line. Because I don't know. But I'll tell you what kind of happened. See, I never took my first alcoholic drink until I was 26 years of age. Um, I was brought up by a very male-dominated uh, family. Uh, very male-dominated. And um, we was told it was weakness. Anyone who drank had a weakness. And we wasn't allowed to have a weakness. My, 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 I come from a mixed race family and it, we're not English um, even though I was born here um, I, I kind of turn around and say I was born in Acne with an Italian father a French mother and brought up by Jewish people and you wonder why I'm screwed up you know what I mean um, but that had nothing to do with it but what I do remember in growing up and I don't remember a lot about my growing up as a child I just bits and pieces you know little bits and pieces. but you know these things called feelings now I don't know what that means by the way but I see people doing it, it really looks good. And that's going to confuse them on the tape now, isn't it? What's he doing? What's he doing? And, um, but what I do remember, is, as feelings go, is, is all right, I remember either feeling very superior or very inferior. And, I, and I'd cheer I'd be, I'd be with you guys there, and I'd be feeling very superior to you. For no justifiable reason whatsoever, I'd feel superior. And you may look at her and say something, which I couldn't even hear, but automatically knew it was about me. And instantly I'd feel very inferior. So I'd go and sit over there and with them and try and feel... And that's how I felt. The other things that are kind of were predominant, I kind of, I don't know whether it's luck or whatever, but I kind of, in my life, I travelled an awful lot. And I loved going places, you know. But I kind of got bored once I got there. And, 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 and the feelings I'd had, I'd arrive at an airport into a town or a city or a country I'd never ever been before in my life. And as I come through the arrivals land, I'd look at the departure land and wish I was them. Now, I don't know where they were going. They could have been going back where I've just come from. But I was bored already from where I was. I loved the, 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 the going there, you know. And that's through many of things in my life. I loved the, the, the going, but not the actual getting there, you know. 
and, and, and I had all these sort of things. And the other thing that I, I, I kind of got was, I always wanted to feel how you looked. That was the major one for me. You know, you look great. I don't know how you feel, but you look really brilliant. And I don't want to look like, I want to feel like you looked. So I'd, I'd go and get my hair cut like you and get clothes like you and, and start listening to your music. And I didn't know what it was about, but I wanted, to, I wanted that. And I never, ever got that. I never achieved it. It's like the same thing. I never, ever got that. And I had this real uneasiness about me. And it was all about, uh, well, just b trying to feel good or trying to look good trying to sound good, trying to copy people, never having a real opinion of my own, you know, never trusting my real opinion, Re realising knowing that if you knew my real opinion, my faults, you wouldn't want to know me, you'd think I was an idiot. And I lived my life like this in a very male-dominated life, doing th things I didn't really want to do, I was uncomfortable doing. And, and then what happened was at the age of 26, I found myself in one of them government bigger the asses, you know, the ones that 12 people say you did do something and you didn't. And, 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 and I ended up in one of these places. And, and what happened was, because of my family connections, I got involved with the backy, which was the currency. In there, and that gave me power. Because one of the things I was addicted to at that stage in my life was I was addicted to having power over your life. It really, and if I had what you wanted, it gave me power over you. And the other thing is about me, and I forgot to tell you, is I'm a natural born coward. Okay? I am scared of my own shadow. But I wouldn't betray that. I wouldn't, my outward signs would say he's not scared of nothing, but inwardly I was a natural born coward. So there I was in this government's bigger the ass, in my little room, absolutely scared to go out in the shower case. Bubba was there waiting for me, so I heard all these stories. Okay, and and what I done was I got the tobacco and I got this big Neanderthal like looking fella, you know, and I thought right, and I got him to do the running for me, and I stayed in my room, and uh, what I done was I went to the library. And I got a book, which is now a film, but back in them days, back in yeah, 82, it was a book that I thought intellectuals read. It was Lord, Lord of the Rings by Tolkien. And everyone's seen that book. It's a big, thick old book. And I put that on the, on the thing, so, on, on the cupboard by my cell door. And my cell door was open. My, sorry, my room door was open all the time. And um, so when you walk past my, my room, you, you'll think, there's an intellectual. And I'll be playing classical music on the radio. Now, the two silly things about that is, A, I'm dyslexic and can't read a word, and B, I can't stand classical music. But, you see, it kind of made me feel so something I wasn't. Do you know what I mean? And what happened was, was some gypsy boys came in, and, and, and due to circumstances beyond my control, I got involved with them, and they started making a thing called Ooch. Because Ooch would give me more power over you people, you know? And um, I got a little bottle, not much bigger than that thing there, and I took it back to my room that night, and um, I found out why they call it ooch, because that's normally the word you make when you drink it. <laughs> it wasn't pleasant, but I've got to tell you something. What it did for me was unbelievable. And there's a guy called Jack Brennan in this fellowship, and he says, he says when he took his first drink, and I'm going to nick his words, what he said was when he took his first drink, he looked up to the ceiling and he said, if God made anything better than this, he kept it upstairs for himself. And that really identified with what Al, Al, that feeling I got. It was, wow. You know, that knot, that hole just went bang, my head went bang, and I went from five foot seven to be seven foot five, and I become a Greek Adonis. And I've got to tell you, walking around a male hotel, feeling like a Greek Adonis ain't a good, safe place to be. <laughs> but what happened was, was I went downstairs and started associating with the other guys there, who I'm petrified of. And then by the end of the evening, I, 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 got, I was chasing the guy down the landing with a snooker cue. This is from a natural born coward. This is what alcohol did to me by taking two mouthfuls of a little bit of a liquid. And I looked at it and I knew this was my solution to my problem. So when I left that hotel a good few months later, um, I didn't wait till six o'clock to have an alcoholic drink. I had to have a drink first thing in the morning, and I immediately started drinking first thing in the morning. And when you're working with a family who, 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 who says drinking's a weakness, and I couldn't afford to be weak, I had to hide my drinking. So I heard that vodka doesn't smell, and um, so I started buying vodka and, and tango. Well, let me tell you, vodka doesn't smell if them people out there drink it. But when you drink it the way we drink it, it stinks to fucking high heaven. But I never knew this, see. I'm thinking, well, I'm thinking I'm the invisible man. You know, nobody knows. Uh, we, we had some car lots. There was five car lots up in Croydon, and, and we had a couple of them. And we was all pals together. 
and uh, we don't look after each other's car, car lots because I'm an hypocrite as well. I'm the world's greatest hypocrite. I've got to say, well, I'll judge everybody, even though I'm doing it myself. You know what I mean? It's do what I say, not what I do. And these guys would go and have a pint and a pie at lunchtime. And I'd walk in and I'd slaughter them. I'd floor them. Hey, you're not getting anywhere near my customers smelling the booze, blah, 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 blah. Walk round the corner, get me a bottle of vodka and <laughs> have a gulp with me tango. And one of these guys said to my brother once, he said, you know, you said, you're running must know be fit. He said, why is that? He said, well, he's always drinking orange juice. He said, if you want to know how fit he is, try and take the bloody can out of him. <laughs> they knew. I didn't know they knew. I got called down to Knightsbridge where, 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 where the heads of my family were, were into a restaurant. It's been my family in the restaurant business one of the, for one of the things we do in the scenes. And they sat me down, and, the, and these two guys, um, and he said to me, Ronnie, why are you drinking? And I didn't know they knew. But immediately, I don't know about you, but my head couldn't lie so quick. It really can. And I came straight up. I said, you ungrateful bees. And he went, what? I said, you're so ungrateful. I said, I found out I've got a talent. I said, I can drink and hold it. I said, I'll take people out. I'll get them pissed and I'll get this family the deal we need. I said, I'm sacrificing myself for you. <laughs> and that became my war cry. I'm sacrificing myself for you. And, and, I, and, and I, it was just ridiculous. And, and what I'd done was I'd just drunk myself out of the public eye. They couldn't leave me anywhere. And I don't know if anyone would, would drunk. I, I, the idea for me was top up drinking during the course of the day. Just keep it at bay, keep it at bay. And at night or early hours of the morning when I got home, it would be that romantic vision I'd seen on the films. You know, the guy loosening off his tie and drinking a martini. Well, I would do that. I'd sit in the chair, loosen off my tie, and then try and gulp down a pint of vodka and orange juice. And, Spill half of it down my shirt, and, and that's what I was aiming for. And go, yeah, that's it. This is what it's all about. Just that <sighs> sense of ease and comfort that comes from drinking the first half of vodka and orange. And I'd get that. But what would happen was, was sometimes I'd mistime it. I don't think we ever done that. Where, where, where I'd have that one drink during the day, and it'd be one drink too many. And all of a sudden, you'd, you'd be thinking, I'm slurring. <laughs> I ain't pronouncing me yes and me things properly here. Uh, and so I'd go, I'd go off, I'd walk off and I'd try and get myself, have a couple of cups of coffee or drink a load of water, and that would make me too sober. And, and I'd have to have another drink and that'd make me too pissed. And it'd be, ah. Oh. <laughs> I knew the day was gone. You know, I just had to go away and get our life's work. But what they would do was, was they would put me on the sites building these restaurants. And, and what I loved was making myself feel important or seem important. So if the plumber looked like he was doing an important job, I'd go and work with a plumber. Don't know what he was doing, but I felt important. And I'd look around and the bricklayer looked like he was important, so I'd run over there. And I'd go around feeling important. And I loved it when the, when the surveyors come on, you know, with the suits. You know, the really, really, really important people. And I'd walk around with the plans like that. I mean, they could be upside down, back to, I wouldn't know. Going, mm, yeah, mm, I agree with you there. Just to make anyone look at me, look, go, he's important. You know, always had to be the most important person on the, on the site. To eventually, they said to me, you can't work on the sites. Because what happened was they turned around, the guys rest of the site said, we can't work with a drunk. He's dangerous. And what, what the other thing is, around about this time, what was happening was, one of the other weaknesses I was told was f for me living my life, and it was kind of okay for me because I'm petrified of this anyway. Was one of the things I, I was was a, a long-term relationship with a woman. They said to me, Ronnie, you know, you you can't do what you're doing and have that. It's another weakness, and you can't have it. And I've got to tell you, I was kind of okay about that because women scare the crap out of me. And I tell you why you scare the crap out of me because I don't understand you. You know, I've learned now, you know, about this fight and flight and all this spiritual, you know. But, you, you see, because what happened with me is, 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 I was scared of you. And naturally, I'd want to either run away or fight you. Well, I know I don't want to run away from you, because somebody's dragging me towards you. And I know I definitely don't want to hit you, but I want to do something, I don't know what. And it, it, it scared me, you know what I mean? Uh, and, and the other thing is, is my alcoholic edge, you see. Because my alcoholic edge would sit and tell me now, and this is truth. I know for a fact all the women in this room fancy me. <laughs> I know it. I know that for a fact. Now, you see, the women are laughing. You say, Ronnie, we don't. I'm happily married. I'm with a nice... And even if I was, and it, you're not it. And that's why the ladies laughed in here. The blokes laughed because they're saying, Ronnie, don't be daft. It's me they want. <laughs> <laughs> you know? 
So I've got all this madness going on. So, so, so female company, long-term basis is a weakness. And so because of my fear, I've never had the front or the audacity. And I hate using the word chat up. It kind of belittles of what, of what you're trying to do. But I never had the front to go up to a strange lady and say, would you like a drink? Would you like a dance? Would you like this? Could I have your man? Well, any of that. So any relationship I had, I had with women that I'd got to know through business and socialised with anyway, and it kind of drifted into a relationship. And because of me, and, and, and I've got to be honest with you, this is also in sobriety with my relationship, my couple of relationships I've had in sobriety. Um, they seem to be very good short term. You know, as a sponsor, I, I, I tell my sponsors, don't ask me about finance or romance. Because I've never had a young lady come back and say, you really can I have three more months of that crap, please? <laughs> it, it, it's kind of never happened. <laughs> I, I've had a couple come back and say, thanks to you, I'm now batting for the other side. But, uh, <laughs> but um, never can we have another go at this. So but what happened was, was a, was a young lady I used to speak to on the phone and she was one of my company, my family's solicitors. We've got, we've got solicitors that work purely for us. And, she was, and I kind of flirted with her on the phone for the last couple of years. And I've got to tell you, this woman on the phone was sex on legs. She was gorgeous. She had the most sexiest, beautiful voice I've ever heard in my life. And we flirted and it was great. A fantastic relationship we had, was having. But she was married and I knew that was safe so I could flirt with her, you see. Anyway, cut a long story short, it turned out we was flirting on the phone and I found out she wasn't married. And I said, oh, we'll have to go out for a meal one night. She said, oh, great. I've never seen this woman, by the way don't know what she looks like, but she's gorgeous, I know she is. And my ego would only allow me to have beautiful women on my arm. Absolutely drop dead gorgeous women. The bitches, most of them, but they would drop dead gorgeous. And, and um, anyway, so we all used to go for a meet, and I met her at Victoria Station, and... <laughs> before we go any further, Remember the ladies in this room, I'm telling you what I used to be like. Alright? I do not want to be physically attacked or abused when I leave this room. This is what I used to be like. Okay? She never looked like I imagined, and I'll leave it at that. And, but I've got to be polite, so we took her out for a meal, so I knew any kind of physical pressure was off of me. You know, that had gone out the window. Okay? That weren't going to happen. So I kind of relaxed, and we had a really good, lovely night, you know? And I took her home that night, and I dropped her off, and she said, would you like to come in for a, a nightcap? So I said, yeah, okay, be polite. That's not happening. Bum. Got in there, and she had her Christmas drinking, and there was a bottle of vodka. Now, I don't know what she was expecting to happen that night, but it didn't. Because I just sat on the, vo on the couch drinking her vodka all night long, talking. And then the vodka finished, the birds started tweeting, and I said, I better go home. I've got work to go do. Well, she rang me up that afternoon and said to me, you know, would you like to come round tonight for a meal? And I said, I'm terribly sorry. I said, I, I think I'm really busy tonight. And she said to me, she said, well, I've replaced the vodka. I said, 7.30, do ya? <laughs> I don't know what happened, but I never went home again. I kind of moved in. And I don't remember doing it. I don't remember making the decision. She'd ring up, tell me she'd replaced the vodka, and I ended up round there. And somewhere along the line, I'm living with her. And at this stage, it's when my family said to me, you better have a few months off and get yourself sorted out. So I'd gone back to her flat where we're now living, her flat, she's buying it. And I said to her, do you know what? I said, what we should do, I said, because we're obviously in a real long-term relationship here. I said, why don't we sell your flat Buy an house that needs work, because you know I'm a builder, and I know all about building. I said, we'll buy an house, and we'll do it up, and we'll put it in your name. And for a very intelligent woman, she was very stupid, because she said, yes, we'll have a bit of that. God bless untreated Alanons. They kept me pissed for years. And um, <laughs> we brought this house, and what she would do was she'd go off to work in the morning, I'd go off to the shop, buy a bottle of vodka, she'd come back down home in the evening, I'll be pissed as a fart and passed out on the set and there'd be a brick wall on the floor. And I went round the house knocking down brick walls. We had three toilets in this house and I took all three toilets out the same day and never put one back. <laughs> that poor cow, and the women that understand this more than the fellas, never had a toilet in the house for three days. The kitchen, the kitchen was a tap and a bucket. That was it. You know, and one night there was no more walls to knock down, it was a building site. 
and was laying in bed and I said, you know why we're doing this, all this renovation work? I said, you know we're because I'm Italian, we want big families. I said, why don't we do a loft conversion? She said, no, no, please, no. So she said, let's start putting some things back. So um, I agreed not to do a loft conversion, even though I knew it was a good idea and the right thing to do, get rid of the mess in one go, you know what I mean, sensible. So she came home the next day, I was passed out on the set, and there was two ceilings upstairs on the floor. So we kind of sat down, and we had a discussion, and we did, the only thing we could do, a suffering alcoholic and an untreated Al-Anon could do, was we put the keys in an envelope, post it through the letterbox of the building society we owed the money to, and buggered off to Italy. And um, my family kind of drove us around and, and sent us from place to place. They kind of settled us up in Milan. And, uh, and as I said, we got restaurants, we got this, we got that. And, and the only thing they could do was they put me on a building site in a place called Legnano. And they gave me an hammer. And they said to me, Ronnie, go and find some nails and pull them out so people don't hurt themselves. So I became a professional nail puller out Up there... I became the world's number one nail puller out. I would hold competitions in my head and I'd win the world title and I'd pull three nails out in half a second flat and madness, insanity. But I loved it because I could get off the site, have a drink, come back and no one would miss me. But all the time, dreaming of being the most important person on the site. And the most important person on that site was the crane driver. And one Saturday morning, you know what's coming. The crane driver never turned up for work. And we had two lorries there from Germany that had to be done. And, and we're building a 12-story block of flats, so you can imagine how high the crane was. So I went up to the drum and I said, I can drive one of those. I said, but the one I drove in London was yellow and that one's red, so the controls will be different. I said, give me half hour, I said, and I'll be all right. And he went, yeah, OK. So anyway, I drove the crane and I got scared. And, and, and what happened was it was petrifying. I didn't want the job, didn't want the gig. I ain't got my glasses on. Um, I'll just presume it's her phone number. I'll call you later, OK? Anyway, I was petrified of driving this crane, and, and it absolutely scared me. And so what happened was I got down, I finished the gig, I got down, and the general drummer said to me, you've got the job. No, I didn't want it. But I knew how to get over fear, you see. I would drink vodka, so I'd take up a two-litre bottle of orange juice with me. I was great. It was fantastic. I was flying around in this crane all over the place for about oh, two weeks until I smashed into the crane next door and nearly killed a load of people. Two cranes of rock like that. There was bricks flying everywhere, the loads we were carrying. And they dragged me out of the crane, took me in the back of the van and put me in the back of the van and sent me over to a building site on the other side of my land and said, there's an hammer, go and pull some nails out. And I become a nail puller out again. You know, and things just progressed drinkingly. She got pregnant. I don't know how that happened. I know how it happens, but I don't know how it happened, if you know what I mean. I'm not that dumb. And she said to me, I've had enough of it. We've been over there about two years, he said, and, and, and I'm going back to England. If you want to see a child, you've got to come back. So I came back to England, and the drink just took off. It just took amazingly. And what happened was, was one day she'd gone out shopping, and I, and I would be eyed him a drink. You know, and I'd hold it under bushes and I'd deny I'm drinking, I'm not drinking, and I am just trying to keep that edge and, and, and just, just trying to survive, really. And one day, she'd gone off shopping with her mum, and, 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 and as she was, excuse me, as she was walking out the gate, there was half a bottle of, half a bottle of vodka under a bush that I'd forgotten that I'd lost. And I picked it up, and I drank it, and it was that bit that took me over the edge. And I was sitting there, and I was looking at it and I realised that all my problems stemmed from my right hand. If it wasn't for my right hand, I wouldn't have had to do the things I did in my life. And I wouldn't have had the nightmares and I wouldn't be drinking. So I came to the only solution a drunk could come to. I went to the kitchen, got out a carving knife and proceeded to cut off my right hand. And because blood come out everywhere, remembering I'm a coward, I screamed my ass down, went running out and was taken to hospital and sewn up. But from there I was taken to a treatment centre. And they turned around and said, in there, it's the first drink that does the damage. You know, I've got to tell you something, I'm not stupid. If you don't have the first drink, you can't get drunk. Okay? So I, when I came out of that, at this detox centre, I, um, I was going to prove whether I was an alcoholic or not. I went to a, a public house, and um, an off-licence, and I brought 
four cans of lager. Okay, and I thought if I so I bought a can of lager, and I said if I'm going to have an alcoholic drink before five o'clock, then I'm an alcoholic, and I'll never drink again. And um, what happened was five o'clock came, I didn't want to drink, so I went and bought a bottle of vodka. I've got a rush here, and then I've got to get to where the point is, and that is. That bottle of vodka lasted me three and a half years. In three and a half years, I went from 11 stone to just under six stone. That bottle of vodka took me to be chemically detoxed in mental institutions, detox centers, and hospitals 24 times. That bottle of vodka made me an image at the last right set of me over twice and have a stroke. That's where vodka took me. It took me from being a very smart, dapper guy to laying on a bed, peeing and pooing myself. And that's where it took me. And I ended up three and a half years down the line in a treatment center. And what happened in there was I was fighting this program. I knew what Ronnie needed. You see, my problem was, was I was an alcoholic and an andy. I wasn't an alcoholic and an addict or an alcoholic and a dope fiend, maybe. I was an alcoholic and a big Joe Bananas. And I couldn't handle what you people were handling. I got to the stage in that treatment centre where I couldn't live, I couldn't die, and I couldn't do what you wanted to do. So what I'd done was I went there and I'd done a deal with them. And the deal was quite simple. I said, I'm going to do everything you've told me to do, nothing more and nothing less. I said, but when I'm dead, you're going to tell my son I was right. And I said, we'll have the deal. And that's all I've ever done. And what got me through that first part of the deal was I'd lay in my bed at night thinking to myself, picturing my funeral, laying in my coffin, and I know I've looked good, by the way, <laughs> with all these people crying to my son, saying, if only we'd listen to Ronnie, he'd be alive today. <laughs> I came to AA because they told me about I had to do that. They said, get a sponsor. I went up to this guy and went, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and he said, we'll have the crack, see what we can do. I can't ring you up as well. <laughs> he said, we'll see what we can do. And I'll go through this and I'll keep it simple because this program has been simple for me. I went through these steps in 24 days with my sponsor. I took the action. I never got a dictionary out anywhere. I never studied anything. I took the action as required. And I tell you the magic thing about that. Now, some people say you can't do that. Some people say you can't. I don't know. I don't know whether you can do that or not. But I've got to tell you something. If I had longer I'd tell you where my drinking was, I think you've got a good idea. That was 14 years ago. And the magic is, not that I haven't had an alcoholic drink in 14 years. The magic is I haven't wanted a drink in 14 years. This program has given me the freedom from the man who's from within. It hasn't given me a big flash car or a big nice house. But it's given me a way of life inside here where Ronnie feels comfortable with Ronnie. And I've got to tell you, the secret is not believing in God. The secret is having a relationship with a man upstairs. AA doesn't work for anybody. But you start working for it, and something fantastic happens. I'll end here on that prayer that I started with in the beginning, in that minute silence. And it's, Lord, fill my mouth with all good stuff. But give me a kick when I've said enough. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.